All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and it is time to unleash the first half of our top 10. These are the 10 through 6 teams right now. These are teams just outside that top five. Could be players when it gets to that four-team college football playoff. But most importantly, I'm joined by my co-host, the man who realized that there's a state holding the Guinness Book of World Records for most of my streets. Yes, it's Rhode Island. My co-host, Fresh. Fresh, how you doing? Hey, it's a lot of streets, but a small place. Perhaps I'm doing great. We are now in the top 10. These teams are all contenders, I will say, for the college football playoff. Some of these can be surprises. Some of these have, are, you know, are on the cusp. But uh, it's going to be great to talk about breaking down and see which ones potentially can make their way to the Final Four at the end of the year. All right, folks, if you have not already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We are on our way to 200 subscribers. So, hey, it doesn't cost you anything, doesn't do anything. So just hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single moment of the college football season as we're moving towards there. Let's go back real quick. If you've missed our first couple of episodes, make sure you go back and listen to those right there. But at 25, we had Pitt Panthers, 24 Mississippi State, 23 South Carolina, 22 Texas Tech, 21 Wisconsin, 20 is UCLA, UNC at 19, Old Miss at 18, Clemson at 17, Kansas State at 16, Oregon State at 15, Texas came in at 14, Notre Dame at 13, number 12 was Utah, and number 11 was Oregon. So now we're talking about those teams that, like you said, these are contenders. And our number 10 team, we've been high on them for two years straight. It's Josh Heupel and the Rocky Top Volunteers. Yep, that is the Tennessee Vols. Fresh, I don't know about you. I think Tennessee, in my eyes, has almost everything. I know they've lost a bunch on offense, as people would say, but it's kind of weird because they have so many things with them and things that were waiting behind there. It comes down to me two areas. The quarterback, Joe Milton, or are we going to see the freshman, Nico? And are they going to be able to stop the pass? Where are you seeing the Tennessee Volunteers? That's a great way to look at a quarterback position. It, you know, any, any team's going to be successful, live or die with the QB. Um, first thing that kind of worries me with Milton, you know, he lost the job at Michigan. He arrived there with Heifel, started maybe half a game, and then had his, you know, put, put on the bench for Hendon Hooker. He looked great versus Clemson in the Orange Bowl at the end. Um, but you kind of just don't know what you're going to get. He's, you know, the top two guys, Hyatt and Tillman, are both gone. He's got to continue to build that rapport with the young guys coming up. I think McCoy will be a fantastic receiver and really, you know, step up into that role nicely. And he's actually worked by a lot of the lower guys in that depth chart, so he has more of that rapport. But now the lights are back on you. You can't hide from this one. You've had too many chances. This is your last opportunity, Joe Milton's perspective. You've got to show up. Expectations are extremely high. You beat Alabama last year. Your fans have been talking a lot about beating and being able to beat Georgia eventually and winning the SEC East and winning the SEC and going to the playoff. That and all falls on your shoulders of being the leader of that volunteer football team, and you've got to find ways to get the W and go out there and win. Um, and Nico, that's a lot to hand on your shoulders right off the bat. You step in, so can you? If you get thrust in that role, can you even handle it? I think Milton probably now that had a year and a half, two years basically under this hypo system, had a chance maybe to mature a little bit. I think he's going to be well suited to take over in, in the role. And this offense really is very quarterback friendly, very receiver friendly. It's two, three seconds, balls out bubble screens, you know, fly routes. There's nothing too complex, but it's very explosive and very lethal as an offense. They were the fifth best passing offense in the, in the country last year, and they were number one in the nation in total yards. So they are going to put points up. They're going to put yards up. Milton just needs to be a little more in himself. He tries to be a little too much the past. Hopefully he's matured. If he hasn't, then Tennessee, I think, is going to be in, in a hurt early on until Nico gets comfortable. If he's confident going out, I think he'll be okay. Uh, you brought up the other point, the defense. When you kind of look at that defense last year, they had some veterans on there. They still struggled getting off the field in big games or in big moments. They gave up, you know, a, a huge lead. They had a huge lead versus Florida, let Florida come back on them. They got smoked by Carolina. They couldn't get off the field versus Georgia, and they allowed Alabama back in the football game. So the, their defense got saved by their offense. This year, some of those veterans are all gone. Maybe that's a good thing for Tennessee. Got a lot of new blood in that defense, but they're going to have to be a little more efficient, getting pressure on the quarterback, owning the line of scrimmage. If there's one thing Josh Heupel needs to learn, look at what Alabama and look at what Georgia have done. You need to own the line of scrimmage offensively and defensively. If you can't own the line of scrimmage, you're going to get a 
beat up. You're not going to be able to control the football game. You're not going to be able to control the pace that you want. Sometimes you got to slow it down. Sometimes you got to speed it up. And a defense, if you cannot own the line of scrimmage, you're not going to get the pass rush home. Your defensive backs are going to be covering a little bit longer. And with them throwing a lot and we're having leads, their offense is going to be, the you know, opponent offense is going to be chucking the ball a lot. And that's how comebacks happen, quick scores. If they can find ways to get past that and really develop and take that jump, I think Tennessee's in a good spot. You look at year one, they only had seven wins. Last year, they had huge expectations. They found a way to come through and live up to them just to almost. Um, now you're in year three. What hypo team are we going to get? Where's this program going to go? You have to go to Tuscaloosa. You get South Carolina and Georgia up in Neyland. Um, this is going to be, I think, a sign of hypo. Are, are you being taken seriously, or are you just two years and you had an explosive offense and you kind of found luck on your side a little bit in year two? This is going to be a staple for him in his career. And it's not, you know, can you challenge your defensive players to show up week in and week out and make plays? And can your offense be consistent? Maybe even tweak yourself. Because sometimes I think they throw the ball a little bit too much and they put their defense back on the field, whether they score quickly or it's a three and out. You put the defense back on the field and eventually by the end of the game, they're exhausted. Sometimes you've got to slow it down yourself, run the ball even more efficiently. Even though they had a great running game last year, slow it down, run the clock out a bit, change up the pace. Because eventually that defense catches on and they get shut down. You've got to find ways to manage your team collectively and not just one side of the ball compared to the other. I think they're going to be in the mix all the way. Their schedule looks pretty solid down the stretch. You know, you have a nice little start there. You get 2-0 and heading in Gainesville. See what happens down there in the swamp. You got uh, UTSA. No, quiet little program can come up in Knoxville, give you a little, you know, little fight. Frank Harris is a pretty good quarterback. You get revenge for South Carolina. They embarrassed you and ruined your college football playoff chance last year. A&M at Bama at Kentucky. And then obviously November 18th, you get the dogs. Um, it, it's not an impossible schedule. I think the Tuscaloosa trip is going to be a little difficult. If I'm, I'm saying it right now, be wary of Texas A&M. They didn't just get all those five-star recruits the past two years and just decide to suck completely. I got a feeling with less expectations, they're going to be a, a team to be reckoned with. They could come up in Neelan and get you. You've got to be prepared every single week in and week out, whether you're in the Big Ten or the SEC or any conference, really. You've got to find ways to play one game at a time and finish it strong. You can't let these expectations and these bright lights just assume you're going to get victories. If you learn anything from last year, you've got to be tough and you've got to play it one week at a time. I have the feeling this team is going to have some young hiccups early on, trying to get some young guys in roles. It'll take them a while to get going. They won't be as explosive early on as they have been in the past two years. But as the season goes on, they'll catch their wind. They'll get the feet under them. I think the ceiling for them is 11-1. and one. The floor is 9-3. and three. Um, Still going to be a very competitive football team. They will be there in the end making noise, and they'll make it very difficult for the George Bulldogs in the SEC East. But I think they'll also give some – they'll show some growth and build a more sustainable product even for the future. This year might not be the greatest year for them, but I think it'll be a great balance point for them to really build a sustainable program, not just be a one-year wonder for 2022. Tennessee's in a great spot. Josh Heupel knows what he's doing. They dodged a huge bullet there with all the sanctions coming out under the Pruitt thing. That's going to help them going forward. Um, I think Tennessee's in a good spot. They could make some noise, but uh, this team I think is actually going to be better in 2024 as opposed to 23. Yeah, Fresh, I – I'm looking at this, and one of the first things I thought of before we went kind of live here is as I've been working on this, and we've had a little bit of time off between records here, and I kept asking myself the question, all right, no one's going to argue one and two in the SEC for the best coaches between Saban and Smart. Whatever order you want to put them in, that's, that's your choice, but no one's going to argue that those are easily one and two. I, and the more I thought about this, the more I felt like Josh Heupel is on the edge of being taking firm control of the number three coach in the entire SEC. I don't think he he's in the argument right now. This is going to be the year that he can really cement himself because it's going to show us really how great of a coach he is. While, yes, you lost Tillman, you lost Hyatt in the secondary, you still bring back McCoy. You still bring back Keaton. Both of them are seniors. You went into the transport portal. You got a six foot five guy, Thornton, out of Oregon there. He didn't play a ton for Oregon, but he's a huge target there and was highly recruited coming out. You get both your lean rushers and smart and right back, 1,600 yards between the two of them. There's a lot to like on this offense. Like, there's a lot to like on this offense. The, com the question comes down to which Joe Milton are we going to see? Are we going to see the Joe Milton right after he transferred from Michigan and couldn't hold on to the starting job and Heupel goes to Hendon Hooker? 
or are we going to see the Joe Milton we saw in the Orange Bowl last year who just absolutely lit up Clemson and a very good Clemson defense? You know, people want to point out, oh, this player set up, this player set up. Clemson had quality on defense. They're going to have quality on defense this year. And to put drop 41 on that team and having a month off to prepare for them, I, I'm interested because this is going to tell us really how good of a coach and how good Josh Heupel is at developing players. So that's on the offensive side of the football. The, really, the question is going to come down to if whether or not this team can win is going to come down to the defensive side. They cannot be 126th against the pass again this year. They can't basically say, Listen, yeah, you're going to throw for 400 yards, 500 yards on us, and we're going to do the exact same to you. Like, we can't win every single game in a shootout. They have to be better defensively. They're fairly good against the run, but they got to improve that pass defense. It scares me a little bit that they're returning a lot of those starters in the secondary. Are those starters going to make that jump? Are they going to get that much better the next year? Because I don't think Heupel's got – while he has the offensive skill players waiting in the wing, like you talked about, the guys that have been working with Milton, I don't think that's true in the secondary. I don't think that's true on the defense. They're going to really have to put a lot of their money into that development of the players over the summer. I hope they've done that. I hope it's going to wind up paying off. Are they going to put these kids in the position to win? I'm with you on the schedule, man. It's an, they should be should be 5-0 and going into their bye week October 7th. Again, we think, well, Florida, like neither one of us think very highly of the Gators this year. That UTSA game in Neyland is a trap game. I mean, coming out of the swamp and then going, like we said, which going against Harris, that's a game where if you do not take the Roadrunner seriously, they could come into Knoxville and upset you. I think that Tennessee is really going to be aiming and, and have a, a target marked on the, on the Gamecocks there in week four, in week five. Then it really comes down to it. I still, I like that Texas A&M is coming in. I got them at 6-0, and and you're going to get the trash kicked out of you by Alabama. You're going to go down to Alabama. You're going to try to do it. Saban's out for revenge in that game. Like, Saban is legitimately out for revenge. I would be, I think that game's going to get ugly very, very quickly. That is the loss right there. Everything in their season from here on out is going to come down to November 18th. Tennessee. We have been a, well, a little more me than Fresh here, but Fresh hasn't been critical of Tennessee as, as respectful as he can be as a, as a Georgia fan there. But we've been high on it, and it's going to come down. You could take that loss versus the, the Crimson died, but if you're – Nine and one going into the Georgia game. That game is for the SEC East. I don't see Georgia tripping up at all going into that game. There's a couple of things that we can argue about and say, hey, maybe this game, maybe that game. I don't see Georgia tripping up until I see them undefeated going into November 18th. That means that game becomes the tiebreaker. Even with a loss to Alabama, Tennessee could win. If they win that game, they're going to Atlanta. That's the, t- that's the measuring point. Last year, you beat Alabama. Folks, it's very hard, very, very difficult to beat Alabama year in, year out. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. I don't know of a program that does it. If you want to take the next step, Tennessee, the next step is you have to beat Georgia. You don't have to win the SEC. Let's say you get tripped up by Kentucky or, or South Carolina. But if you can beat Georgia on um, November 18th, this is a huge season for you. And all of a sudden, I don't care if you're playing in the Tax Flair Bowl there, beating Georgia and having that feather in your cap and knowing what's coming down the pipe in 24 and 25, again, when you move away from the division thing, I think that this could be a huge thing for Tennessee. Again, if Tennessee loses to Georgia and you go 10 and 2, no one's going to fault you. But everyone's going to say you're just not there yet. So Tennessee, are we looking at 24 for you? Or is 23 going to be the year we say, okay, Tennessee is officially back and it all comes down to November 18th versus the Georgia Bulldogs? I like how you mentioned, the, you know, the, this is the last year of the divisions with ten, you know Texas and Oklahoma arriving next year. Some of these little rivalries and these little, you know, measuring sticks 
are going to become few and far between going forward. So this might be your last shot if you're the vol. You know, even though next year in 24 they do play, you know, each other, but you might get limited more opportunities to get these kind of measuring sticks, these kind of wins. So, you know, those chances are, are slim and few, and few and far between coming in the you know the next five to six seven years. You got to take advantage of when it's, when the opportunity is there. Um, Presh, I got this team. I'm exactly with you. I got 11 and one. I'm going to say I don't see them having a snowball chance in hell to beat Alabama going into Tuscaloosa. I think Nick Saban's just ready for it's one of those games that Saban's going to circle. Who knows? And the best thing is going to be whether or not they beat Georgia. If, I, I think that if you told me a place to bet on this, I got them in at 10 and two. Like I would be fairly strong at 10 and two. Nine and three is also my floor with, with uh, Tennessee. Sounds like a deal. Folks, let's go to our number nine team in the country, and that is the Washington Huskies. Quietly had a ridiculously good year. Okay, so Caleb William wins the Heisman, but who's the best quarterback in college football? A young man by the name of Michael Penix Jr. Folks, you don't remember, if that name sounds somewhat familiar to you and you're sitting there going, wait a minute, Michael Penix Jr. is over at Washington? I didn't think he was at Washington. You're right. You're probably remembering Michael Penix Jr. when he's over at Indiana. He was the quarterback at Indiana that made them take a huge leap. They went on a huge run over there. He wound up tearing his ACL the following year there, transfers over to Washington, finally gets healthy. He's on, uh, I think he may be on year six in his college career fresh. Correct me on that one. He's on the doctoral program. Yeah. Yeah. But the crazy thing with Penix, man, is he has got, too ridiculous. And I mean, maybe we could even talk about three. I, I, I've even leaned toward three. Th- this could be this wide receiving room with Odunzu, McMillan, and Polk. That could give Ohio State and Texas a run for the best wide receiver room in the country. I'm still going to lean Ohio State, slightly biased. I'll admit that. But I'm, I'm going to put a lot of respect on this, this team's name. Washington is a really, really good football team. And if so, to me, if someone's going to knock off Utah for Pac-12 champion, I think we're looking at this. We have another Pac-12 team rate a little higher. I'm, I'm a little higher, though, overall on the Washington Huskies. What say you, Fresh? I mean, those three receivers, they're, you know, amazing. You have 2,000-yard receivers there in the Dunes, EA, McMillan, they were one and three in the Pac-12 in yards receiving last year. But then you have Jalen Polk, just solid number three. Only had 694 yards and six touchdowns as the three. Um, that was year one with Penix and Kellen DeBoer, the head coach, who just arrived from Fresno State. You're giving them now an entire offseason to really gel. They're all healthy, flowing, and adapting and building off what they did. This could be a very lethal team. They were already the second-best offense in terms of total yards per game in the nation last year. Best passing attack in the nation, having 370 yards, base 369.8 will round up, give you 370. And seventh in the nation in points a game at 39.7. And now they have a year to get even better. They're, look, I don't care what you say, outside, outside of Utah, defense in the Pac-12 is optional. Um, that's part of the reason why these teams light up the scoreboard, because there's not many ones stopping anybody. So I could even see them scoring 45 points a game and making it look easy. Um, Penix Jr.'s in line for a heck of a season. But just like Tennessee, Washington's the same kind of thing. Explosive offense, quarterback, machine, receivers everywhere. Can you play some defense? If you can play some defense, you can maybe beat Oregon, which you already did in a, in a lucky way when Bonix got hurt. You'd be able to compete with team in US, USC, maybe UCLA. Um, Oregon State's good. There's a team in Colorado has some entertainment around them. And then Utah is always competitive and always in the two-time defending champion. Um, you start playing some defense at Washington, then you're not just being talked as a Pac-12 contender. You're talked as a potential playoff team and a national contender. The only Pac-12 team to compete in the college football playoff ever is Washington back in 2016. That team was relied heavily on defense. This team is heavily on offense, but can they find a way to play some defense and maybe make a chance to win the, the, the Pac-12? Put up a big bunch of numbers. They have an opportunity, but this comes down to are they mature enough to handle the, the, the expectation? Nobody thought anything on them last year. Nobody gave them a blink of an eye until they beat the trash out of Michigan State. And we were like, well, Michigan State's supposed to be really good after the year before. How does Washington come in and slaughter them? And then as the year got forward, we're like, 
you know what? That wasn't a fluke. Washington's really legit. But yeah, Washington, Michigan State stunk, but Washington truly legit. And you found out the proof in the pudding there. Now you have the expectations of, we expect you to be a 10-win, 11-win team competing for a Pac-12 title or a playoff spot. Um, where are you going to be able to hold up your end of the bargain? That's what this comes down to. Penix, you've, you, when you were in Indiana in 2020, nobody really expected much. And you guys came out there and you had a heck of a season. You almost beat Ohio State in the shoot. And then, unfortunately, you got hurt. You didn't have expectations that you shocked everybody, kind of fell. You know, unfortunately, the injury knocked you guys down a little bit after that. But here we are back again. Expectations from you as a quarterback, but now expectations of Washington as a team to show up. I'm interested to see what they, what they do. They, are, they do have a stud on defense, Braylon Trice, 10 sacks last year. But they do have to replace linebacker Jeremiah Martin, who had eight and a half. You're losing a lot of production there uh, from the linebacker spot. Can somebody else show up and help out Trice? He's an anchor of that defensive line. Can you build guys around him? Can some guys in the secondary show up? Um, you're gonna have to. You're gonna need him when you're going against the prime of teams in that league and who's throwing the football around. This is interesting. If DeBoer can get this team to play at a high level and be consistent and keep them grounded and focused, and they can somehow keep winning and building off of it, could he even get a bigger job? Could he turn Washington to a, a, a legit, consistent power instead of a one or two years up and then a couple years down? Could he actually own the Pac-12? Because you know what? Lincoln Riley's shown that in big, big games, Lincoln Riley doesn't really – him and his squads don't show up. So that gives you a, a blink of hope that you may be able to steal the Pac-12. They're fancy at USC. Everyone expects them to be glorious. Could your team show up and make wins? Uh, this is an intriguing spot for Washington. I don't, think, I don't really recall a time where this team has had expectations this high. Even when they went to the playoff, I don't recall them having expectations this high as being a preseason top 10 team, ninth overall. They do have a tough schedule. Open up Boise State. You get travel to East Lansing, the other end of that, you know, home and home. You get Oregon and Utah at home, and you travel to USC and Oregon State. November 4th through the 18th. Now, you can make it through October, but everyone, the phrase is, be remembered in November. The 4th through the 18th, you got at USC, Utah, at Oregon State. That will test the measure of this football team. Are you good enough down the stretch and the weather gets bad? Will the passing attack still survive? Or can the defense show up and win an ugly, messy football game? That's the real big question. We won't know that for a few months now, but you have to put yourself in the position of actually those games really don't matter. If you stink it up early on, those November games don't matter. If you build yourself up to that point and you consistently get better as the year goes on, those games now are ma- increased significantly, and you have a chance of really making a showcase win or two or three and putting yourself in the national spotlight. I think the ceiling for this team is 11-1. and one. They have a chance of maybe putting up a big show, carrying them through, but the floor, just like Tennessee, I think nine and three. There could the offense just be a little too much, and the defense not be there to help them and support them. That might be the downfall. Eleven and one, nine and three, somewhere in the mix. But this team will be in the conversation come November. Who fresh? Ooh, sign me up for October fourteenth. I can't wait. Oregon traveling to Washington. Oregon's going to be upset minded on that one. Both have the week before off. That game's going to be a dogfight right there. But you're right. The real season for Washington is going to show up in November. You can lose to Oregon and be okay. If you wind up, because USC is going to be pretty high going into that game. They'll still be pretty highly ranked, I I have a feeling. Utah, we think Utah is one of the better run programs in the entire country. And then everyone knows how difficult it is to go up to Corvallis and beat the Beavers in their own own area. That that three game stretch is going to be a nightmare for the Washington Huskies. If they can do it, this is going to be a remarkable story. I I'm looking at them, and I could easily see at the end of this season us talking about the Washington Huskies in the playoffs. I also could see them being a little bit pissed off from last year. Fresh, they went to the Alamo Bowl. At 11-2, and two, or 10-2, and two, and with this amazing season that they had, they only lost, the two games they lost were by 15 total points. And I know they were matched up with Texas, but I feel like if I was a Washington player, if I'm the coaching staff, I say, we deserve more. We deserve more than the Alamo Bowl. We deserve a better invite than this right here. 
We deserve to be playing on New Year's Day. I don't care if it's the Capital One Bowl, but we deserve to be playing after January 1st. I think that the coaching staff could have this team really fired up. Now, the thing that scares me is that they're an injury away from an 8-4 and four season. And I have 8-4 and four as their floor because if something happens to Pinnix, this season is over. I don't think that they're... They're going to get the electric type of play from the backups behind them. Even with these wide receivers that they have, even with Trice coming back, his nine sacks, getting after the quarterback there, they were third in the Pac-12 in sacks last year with 35. This team can get pressure on the quarterback. That's what gave Bo Nix a boatload of trouble. You look at the end of that Oregon game, go back and watch the late third quarter, early fourth quarter over there. We we saw what this Oregon pat or this Washington pass rush was able to do to Oregon. And if they're able to do that consistently, this is a team that could run the table. I have them that their ceiling is 12 and 0. I have their ceiling as an undefeated season because on paper, they are good enough to beat every single team on their schedule. Now, is that going to happen? Probably not. Are they probably going to suffer a loss along the way? I think so. I think going to USC in November, early November, I think that's a really, really tough game. I probably would, if I had to put some money on that game, I'd probably go USC in that game. But on paper, Washington has the talent to, to compete with anyone on their schedule. This is a really good Washington team. And folks, if you have never watched Husky football, you're not like big fan of Pac-12 after dark, you need to go out of your way to watch the Washington Huskies this year. This is a really, really good football team and probably a really, you know, kind of fun pick. If you want to make a pick for your final four in the playoff, Washington would be a great pick out of the Pac-12 if you don't want to go with the traditional Utah or USC. So I like this Washington team. and I, I, I'm really excited to hear the final chapter of Pennix Jr.'s story. You know, you see what he's done, what he's had to go through. It's going to be a remarkable story when it's all done. And we kind of close the book on that and he goes on to the next level. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited for Washington, man. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what they do about it. I love the way you took that point of Penix Jr.'s story. Because, you know, I think the one thing we'd look at sports in general where you deal with adversity but you have to rally. You put your, you pick yourself up up off the mat. You get yourself revived, and you fight back, and you overcome it. Um, that's where the team mentality comes with. That's also individuals, and that's be really great to see him come from a point where he thought probably his career was over to where he's at now, and even beyond. It's something really special. Right. All right, fresh. Let's go to our number. Where are we at? Number eight. Our number eight team is the LSU Tigers. People forget this team won the SEC West last year. Now, they got boat raced in the SEC title game. I don't care if you say that they put up 30 points on Georgia. That doesn't really matter because most of those points were scored in garbage time. Uh, man, I don't know, man. This I don't really know what to make of LSU, to be honest with you, Fresh. I'll let you go first because the thing that we I just kind of want to go with is this going to just keep being the Jaden Daniels show? And are they going to have anything other than him? You know, it's funny. We get last year, you know, we had to do with the whole Brian Kelly nonsense and the fake accent. And, you know, they had, we're dealing with the aftermath of Coach O and, and all that nonsense. Um, in the first half of that game versus Florida State in the opener last year, they looked like a mess. And then something happened. They turned around, they fought back had a chance to win. They didn't, but they had a chance. And maybe we all should have paid a little more attention to that of maybe these guys are growing up a little bit more. They were just sort of awestruck and too much going on. You know, coaches coming and going and, you know, they had to get themselves settled. But slowly as the season progressed, you know, there were some, up, there were some bumps in the road. They got slaughtered by Tennessee. But then after that Tennessee game, you sort of saw them take a pause, pull it off an upset of Ole Miss, gain some traction. And then Brian Kelly finally beating Alabama. His, his intent was to go down to LSU and to beat Alabama because he couldn't do it at Notre Dame. Goes for two in Baton Rouge, gets it. 
And it kind of felt like one of those, you know, monkey off the back moments, not just for him, but even for the team of like, maybe we have something here. Maybe we could do something because Jay Daniels at Arizona State was okay. He wasn't great. And we we're like, okay, he's mm-hmm. a guy, at LSU, whatever. You saw him get better. You saw this team sort of building on each other. Um, nothing, it wasn't sexy. It wasn't pretty. But in the end, all you do, you're paid to win football games. You're playing to win football games. It doesn't matter if it's three to nothing or 42 to nothing. Um, and Brian Kelly and that staff and that team, as the year went on, built it. They have measuring sticks of where they need to get to because obviously that SC title game, they got smoked. But they went out and smoked Purdue, obviously not the same competition, but they laid the Purdue pretty good in the, in the Citrus Bowl um, on January 1st. The direction's changed. LSU's always going to recruit the state of Louisiana. Um, and they're going to have kids who are one stars who are going to become NFL players just because they're just a bunch of dudes down there. And if Brian Kelly could figure it out and make this team a tough team and get guys to buy in and play, like we sort of saw last year, this team could be special. But it comes back to Jaden Daniels. He made a lot of that happen with his feet and his arm. Um, last year, he grew him into his own. Now he has to take the next step. He can't just be an average or above average quarterback. He's got to be an elite quarterback because, like you said earlier, Nick Saban's pissed at Tennessee. He's also pissed at LSU. He had two losses last year by a combined four points. He's not happy. And now your measuring stick is not just to play the SEC West and win the SEC West. You need to beat Alabama multiple years now. Good luck. You've got to play better. Malik Neighbors, your stud receiver last year, had a heck of a year. We all thought Kayshawn Booty was going to be the guy. Kayshawn Booty went and cried like a little baby, and I think he's still crying at New, uh, New England Patriots you know, mini camps right now, getting yelled at by Bill O'Brien. Malik Neighbors, are you going to be a stud LSU receiver like old, all the other names we can list off forever? Or are you going to be the Kayshawn Booty, the one-year wonder, and then fade and go cry because you don't get the ball a lot? That's on you. Because we all thought Booty was going to be a big star last year, and he waited. He faded out real quick. He ran and hid, and he's doing it right now. That's on you, Neighbors. Are you going to be the stud? Because I think you have talent, but you've got to prove to yourself that you're a bigger guy, and you're a bigger man, and you're a team player, and you're going to show up for everybody. Because if you're there and Daniels is there, the offense is going to build off that because you always know LSU's got a bunch of stable of unknown running backs who are tough and to run the football. If you can score and be able to make it run your receiver routes and get the other guys to play at a high level and keep that standard to LSU, you'll be okay. But what is LSU really known for? They're known for defense. You got Harold Perkins Jr. and Mick Wingo. The two of them on the defense leading those guys, those Tigers are going to get after you. They were great last year. Can they take that next step and become an elite defense? There was games where they could not get off the field or they struggled. Tennessee smoked them. Georgia smoked them. They had moments where they couldn't get off the field versus Alabama. Um, they can take that next step and grow and get better. Once they grow and get better, that LSU defense true mentality of his, you know the past 25 years as Nick Saban stepped on, on campus way back when and then obviously carried through the other coaches after that, if you can get it back to that point, you're going to be in a great spot. And then LSU will truly be back. But this is that year now. Expectations are high. You just won the SC West. You're in competing. You're a top 10 team. You have a lot of you know returning assets. Can you guys grow and develop and get better and return to an elite S, uh, an SEC program, an elite national program that you have been in the past few years? That is what's weighing on this team. Brian Kelly, can you coach at that high level? When you were at Notre Dame, you're not getting the Boston Colleges and the Navies, all due respect to both your programs. You're not getting them on your schedule. You're not getting to pick who you want to play. You're getting a pissed off SEC West. You're getting a better A&M. You're getting two schools in Mississippi who are angry. You're probably going to get a better Auburn team this year than you had last year. You're going to get a mad Alabama, and you're going to play teams from the East. How can you carry up next? You know, year one, you went in and won the West. Now you've got to up one up your own self and get better. I'm kind of worried about how you're going to coach. Are you going to coach like you did last year and go for two against Alabama at home, or are you going to coach a little more scared, a little more conservative? You've got to play loose and fast at LSU. The players want to play. That's the way they run down there in Louisiana. You've got to take it and play a little faster, a little higher, and let the players sometimes do it and maybe get yourself out of the way. If you can get yourself out of the way but maintain a low discipline for this football team and maintain a, phys- a physical mentality, LSU will be fine. If you start getting tight and playing scared, you're going to get smoked and you're going to get run out of town. That's where I think last year you set that bar so high that you now have to match it and surpass it very, very quickly. After Florida State in your opener, which I think is going to be a barn burner of a football game, you get Grambling State, Mississippi State, Arkansas, Ole Miss, Mizzou, and Auburn, and then Army. Pretty winnable schedule there, but all that matters, can you beat Alabama again? Can you go into Tuscaloosa and do it? If you can, you truly got LSU in the right spot. If not, you're back to a learning curve and maybe you know let the chips fall where they may. 
I think this team is in a great spot. There's always going to be talent at OSU. Brian Kelly, just don't mess it up and get out of the way. I think the ceiling for this team is 12-0 and in the regular season. The floor is 9-3. and We'll see what the Tigers got. And is Brian Kelly truly the man for the job? So before we get a bunch of LSU fans saying like that they have other things other than Jaden Daniels, I know that they do have other things other than Jaden Daniels. Like you said, Noah Kane to me is the big kind of X factor here. Last year, Jaden Daniels ran the ball 186 times, 885 yards, had 11 touchdowns. It's great. But the problem is with Daniels, he also took 43 sacks last year. On top of that, running the football all of those times. That's a lot of hits. That's a lot of times putting your body at risk to really mess up this program. Now, I know LSU's got talent. They always will have talent sitting behind guys as well. You're right on that one, Fresh, because LSU always kind of, like, they can recruit just the LSU, Alabama, East Texas area and have a loaded program that most universities would love to have that wealth of talent there. Noah Kane, are you able to really step up and build on your 10 touchdowns from last year? LSU has always had a really, really great running back, a bruiser running back who's able to take that pressure off of the quarterback. Is Kane able to do that? Is he going to be able to be that running back where he's going to be the bell cow? I don't know. I don't know if I hope Brian Kelly is smart enough to know that he he can't put his quarterback in this much danger throughout the year and expect to continue to have the success he did. You're right, Fresh. I, again, neighbors, great wide receiver, had a great year. I'd like to see what he does this year in second second season. He's got to find the end zone more. Only three touchdowns, 72 catches, great possession receiver, love it. But he couldn't find the end zone. And Jenkins is gone. He was your leading receiver for touchdowns with six last year. But watch out for Brian Thomas Jr. Okay? I like this kid coming up this year. He had 31 catches last year. He's a junior, six foot four. Kind of reminds me of the previous LSU receivers that have been such a beast down there. It, it really is going to come down to these players. Are they are these secondary players that were a, had a role within the offense, are they willing to say that we're going to, instead of just having a role, are you going to be able to shoulder some of the offense? Are you going to be able, when Daniels is having an off day, are you able to take over the game? Are you able to be in Oxford, Mississippi in the middle of an afternoon and be able to run for 145 yards and two touchdowns to really put that offense on your back and put the deep, and put the pressure on the running Rebel defense there? Are you able to disrupt them? Are they, going to, is, are they going to have that next great safety over there at LSU and Brooks? He's a senior this year, had a good year. Is he going to be that center fielder that LSU has been known for of having this great defensive backfield and giving you fits over there? I know different coaching staffs, different philosophies, but there's also a level of expectation, a sense of pride that, that a university takes in producing players of that NFL caliber. I don't know, man. Fresh, I really don't know what to think about LSU because when I look at their schedule, I should sit there and tell LSU fans, your, your season comes down to two games. It comes down to Florida State, week one in Orlando, and it comes down to November 4th versus the Crimson Tide in Tuscaloosa. But then there's a part of me that sits there and goes, are they going to get tripped up by Old Miss? Are they going to get tripped up? Is Texas A&M going to come in and ruin the season the last week of the season? I don't know. Like, I don't have confidence in this LSU team. I don't, and, and I don't think it's necessarily the players at LSU. I just think that Brian Kelly's getting patted on the back for when the SEC West at 9-3. I mean, they were 9-3 and three last year. They were an okay team. They were very good. They were fun to watch. They're not bad. I'm not criticizing them. I'm just worried that we're setting them up for really high expectations. And, and I think you made a great point. Me, the first year we did this podcast, we talked about Arizona State. We had a long one 
really long night conversation with some Arizona State fans. And we talked about Jaden Daniels a lot and how great he, he was a really good quarterback out there, but he wasn't like this unbelievable exceptional quarterback. Is he just a need a better system type of guy? Or is he really like can elevate everybody else? I think we're going to learn a lot about him this year. And I think we're going to learn a lot about Brian Kelly as a coach because if Brian Kelly can't take this team, and again, my floor for them, if I'm an LSU fan right now, my floor should be 10 and 2. If you lose to Florida State, it's acceptable. You can, it's, I mean, no loss is acceptable, but you can understand it. They're a good football team. If you lose to Alabama, it's understandable. Really good football team. But if I'm losing to other people, then my expectations of what it means to be an LSU program, because you're one of the top 10 programs in all of college football. I mean, I legitimately put LSU as one of the best programs in college football. So that means your expectations should be higher. You should expect more from your team. And if you don't get this team to 10 and 2 this year, if you're 9 and 3 or 8 and 4, and I can see 9 and 3, gosh, if they go 8 and 4, Brian Kelly should be on the hot seat. I know he won't be, but he should be. Um, I would be very nervous, nervous if I was LSU going into 24 and if I wasn't 10 and 2. And I could see 11 and 1 as their ceiling. Kelly wanted that smoke um, as he, right. he you know, came out in the media days. Like, well, I had offers from here, right? Tennessee and this one and that one, and we're not. He chose LSU partly because he wanted to play Saban. He wanted to challenge himself. But you chose the smoke. Now you got to step it up and back it up. Yeah. All right, Fresh. Let's go to our number seven team in the country. Man, how far these guys have come. It is the Florida State Seminoles led by Jordan Travis, Trey Benson, and maybe the most physically imposing wide receiver in all of college football, Johnny Wilson there. And it's remarkable. You look at Florida State, what they're bringing back on top of all of these things. Jared Verse, who is a fringe first-round pick, a fringe day-one draft pick in the NFL, decides to come back to Tallahassee to run it back with this team. Fresh Florida State. Are we talking about a resurgence from the 90s here? This is, they should have everything in front of them. And should the expectation be playoff or bust? I mean, the ACC is wide open. Uh, Clemson's not who they, they were the past few years. This, this is the best four state team we're going to probably see since the 2013 2014 years where they went the, the last year of the BCS, first year of the playoff. Under, you know, James was the quarterback and they won the Natty out there in the Rose Bowl. And, um, you know, Calvin Benjamin and, you know, and th- those, uh, Dalvin Cook with the running back, Jalen Ramsey, like this is that kind of feel of this kind of four state team, um, getting back to who they were. And it's funny how when Norvell showed up, we were like, this guy, 20 rides of 2020, the place he was making, it was a mess, complete mess. And then last year, we all thought they were still going to be a joke. He was going to get it fired. We had him on the hot seat and, he beats LSU in the opener down there in New Orleans. And then just – he kind of just puts it all together. Jordan Travis comes through, and they just show flashes, and they get better and better every single week. And they play an epic, you know, cheese it Bowl, and they beat Oklahoma. And now we're like, all right, Oklahoma, you know, that's great. It's a good win. You beat it. You beat a big name. And, and But now everyone's coming back. Travis is coming back. you got talent coming, you know, left and right. Guys coming in through the transfer portal. This, this is it right here for Norvell. This is what he's been building at, at Florida State, and this might be the, you know, the the real resurgence in getting that program back to a stable p- perspective, which we haven't seen in almost a decade. Um, there's a lot of excitement there in Tallahassee, and I think this football team under Jordan Travis's lead at the quarterback position has a chance to really meet them and maybe even surpass them. You kind of look at, you know, you mentioned Johnny Wilson, dude's huge. Benson at running back. You go out your Jamine, you know, Jamine Jaheim Bell from South Carolina, you got weapons all over the field. Can the offensive line hold up? There's always been, you go back to Florida State years in the, in the recent times, Florida, the offensive line has been pretty rough, and that's always been the thing that's held them back. If they can get some decent offensive line play, protect Travis, allow the running able to continue to build up, this team could go. You're going to have athletes on defense, dudes flying around, making plays, but can you get an offensive line to protect your quarterback and allow the running back consistently? If you can, 
this the limit, you know, sky's the limit for this Florida State football team right now because the ACC, you know, you have Drake May there at North Carolina. You got Clemson, but they're not the Clemson, especially on offense, that they have been, you know, under Deshaun Watson or Trevor Lawrence. They're, they're far from that at this point. You have a chance, um, and you got to take advantage of the opportunities when you have a present. Final two games of the year, though, last year kind of worries me about coming into this year. You gave up a combined 70 points and 500 yards rushing to two six and seven football teams in Florida and Oklahoma. You've got to be better defensively and shutting down the run. You cannot let mediocre football teams run the ball down your throat like that. You need to get off the field and maximize your possessions and offense to help your team. And if you're getting run on like that by bad teams, you start playing some good teams, especially in the playoff, if you get there, then you're in trouble. Because we've seen some power teams at the line of scrimmage who own it. And I mentioned about Tennessee, you've got to own the line of scrimmage. If you cannot get stop the run and get off the field, they're going to wear you down and wear you down and wear you down, and then you're never going to get a chance to win the football game. You've got to improve on defense. You had a lot of attrition through the transfer portal, too. A lot of that depth is gone. Can you be able to get young guys stepping up a lot quicker and filling in those gaps? getting those meaningful minutes, especially on, on defense, and helping get off the field and be, be legit contributors, not waiting a year or two. A bunch of those kids went to Colorado. Kids are sprinkled over the nation. You've lost a lot of depth. Can you get that depth back on the defensive side of the football to improve and to get off the field much more consistently? Outside of the LSU game in the opener, which you're playing in Orlando, the four toughest games are all on the road. So you're going to have to become road warriors this fall. you got to go to Clemson. you got to go to Wake. got to go to Pitt. and got to go to Florida. The Swamp, it's a rivalry game. I don't care how good or bad Florida is going to be. That game, you're going to have to play your hearts out to win. Pitt, Pat Darnuzzi, going up to you know there, that's going to be a battle. You're going to have to show up. And obviously going to Death Valley, got a feeling it's probably going to be an 8 o'clock kickoff. They're going to run down the hill. They're going to tap the stupid rock. Um, it's, it's going to be an event. You've got to be ready to show up. You're not playing in Doak this time. You're not playing a noon kickoff. You're playing under the lights this year. You've got to be ready, and you can't let them shine too bright or you're going to go blind and you're going to miss your opportunity. Miami is the only true home game that can be a challenge just because that is a rivalry game. And kids from Miami might get up for it. Mario Cristobal might have, might have improved the team after last year. But it's the only true game at home you're going to have to actually really truly get up for and be ready for a full-on 60-minute battle. The schedule plays out really nice for them. You won't have to play North Carolina unless you play them in the ACC title game. You're in a good spot. Um, I think the ceiling for this team is 12 and 0. The floor, though, could be 8 and 4. If Jordan Travis gets dinged up because it's not much depth behind him at quarterback, he's the key and the linchpin to this offense. If he gets dinged up or has any inconsistency or doesn't live up to expectations, this thing could fall fall apart pretty quickly. 8 and 4 is the floor. Undefeated regular season is the ceiling for Florida State. Um, we're going to know a lot about this team and the previous one mentioned LSU. You know, Labor Day weekend. We're going to see how tough these two teams are if they're really willing to live up to expectations that everyone's placed on them as well as us going forward in 23. Fresh, I could seriously sit here and most of my notes are exactly the same as yours. And I could recap everything you've said about Jordan Travis, Johnny Wilson, Benson, first, the defense, the schedule, all of those things. And you're not wrong. We're not wrong on this. It's spot on and these things are going to come down to it but there's you know there's an old saying the devil lies in the details and I kind of kept thinking I go when I was looking at Florida State I kept asking myself what is that Achilles heel where is where like this makes too much sense they're playing in yes okay they could lose week one to LSU and it wouldn't matter really At the end of the day, it wouldn't matter. If they run the table and boat race everyone in the ACC, beat Clemson, go up go up to Clemson, win that that game. Go up to Pitt, win that game. Go and play Florida, win that game. They still should be a playoff. But the question comes down to me, in my eyes, is where is that yeah, but? Florida State was only 51% on third down last year. 51% with all of these weapons, with all of these weapons, you still struggled to convert on third down. And while we're saying, well, yeah, they converted more than half of them. That's, that's still a big problem to me. And especially I was thinking about this more and more. You take a look at this. Jordan Travis had 24 touchdown passes last year. 
They had 33 rushing touchdowns. They put up some serious points offensively. And then I started looking deep, deeper. When the game's on the line, what's going to be the one thing that will keep coaches up at night? And I was thinking, and the first person that came into my mind was Coach Paul McCord. And I was thinking about him and thinking about, well, maybe I should take a look at their special teams. They got to be better on special teams. I know this sounds weird in the third facet of the game. What what college program are we ever talking on special teams? Their kicker last year was 50% from beyond 30 yards. He was 7 for 14 outside of 30 yards. Now, if you go inside 30 yards, 20 to 29 yards, because you can't get any closer than that, he was 5 for 6. But then every, when you start moving it out a little bit further and further, Grandy, it looked like he's a little bit better from 40 to 49 out, out there. But if you take a look at what he was from 30 to 50 plus, he was only 7 for 14 on the year. That could be the difference. When you are looking at being an elite level team, if you're looking at being one of those top teams, if we're really starting to talk about Florida State and Mike Norvell taking the seminal team back to where we – think Florida should be at or Florida State should be at. I'm sorry on that one. If we think that it's coming in there, it's going to come down to the details within this program. If they can't be better on third down, if they can't when it comes when they get stopped on third down and they're sitting at the 28 yard line, are they able to hit a field goal from there and put points on the board and continue to pad that lead or continue to take down someone else's lead? Because those points are going to really matter. Okay, if you wind up, and this is my biggest fear for Florida State. Florida State's schedule is not tough. It's not. Okay, and we can make a big deal out. LSU, I get it. Tough game, I'll give you that one. Going into Clemson, tough game on that one. Both of those. But once you get past that, you should be at least a seven-point favorite in every single one of the other games. So at the end of the day, Let's say they go one and two against, or one and one against Clemson, LSU, and this team's eleven and one wins the ACC title here is going to the playoff. Uh, my fear is that Seminole fans are going to be really excited about a team that that their details are missing to really be that national title level of contender. That's what worries me about Florida State. I'm not worried. Listen, if you ask me, do I think this is a New Year's Day six team? Absolutely, 100%. I think this is a great football team. Are you asking me if they're a national title contender? It's coming down to the details in my mind. Fresh, I can't see this team going any worse than 10-2. and two. And if they go 10-2, and two, it's going to be two losses early in the season. Um, I say that their ceiling's 12-0 and 0 as well. I think that this team's got all the talent in the world. Are they? Is Norvell able to put all of the pieces together to put this team on a run and really to get Tallahassee rocking again, because hey, those home games are going to be a blast because you're going to see everyone blowing. Up. The Seminoles are going to blow out almost every one of these teams at home. I, I'm, I'm maybe Miami might give you a game, but Doke is going to be rocking. Well, first off, I think kickers in Florida State is a very sensitive subject historically, so you know that could you know we don't want to go wide left or wide right just just now. Um, and also looking at LSU Florida State Open, I know we already our preview a couple, you know, in a while now, but I want to hear your opinion. Who needs that win more? Looking at the way that full season breaks out right now, who needs that win more? LSU. You think LSU needs that? You think Florida State can make the playoff with a loss to LSU? Yeah, I do. I think that if LSU loses that game and then stares down like the barrel of, th then for LSU to make the playoff, that means they have to run the table in the SEC. They got to beat Bama. They got to be able to get to Atlanta, get to the title game there, and then win the title game as well. I don't see. I think LSU's season hangs by a thread if they lose that game. Florida State, not so much. Like Florida State, peep, time time heals all wounds on that, especially if it's a close loss. Like let's say it's the exact. Let's say we flip last year's loss and be 
what what was it, 29, 28, or 28, 27, something like that? Something um, like that, yeah. We take it and make it that, and in, in Florida State loses that. But then on top of it, they then go into Clemson and then put the boots to – they got – three weeks later, they got another shot to really make a name for themselves. And then they don't they don't really get tested the rest of the way. So they'll just go out and we'll, we'll light up the scoreboard and, and win those – you know, the eye test points, which we both know that that schedule is not very tough. So, but people will then start to forget. I think Florida State needs it a lot more because LSU has a chance of beating an Alabama and getting an extra boost of, you know, attention there later in the season. Florida sure. State, if the ACC is not going to be that strong, it hasn't been. And no. if, if there's bumps in the road or Clemson, you know, lay, lays an egg down the stretch and they're like, oh, you beat a Clemson team, congratulations, good for you. If Florida isn't very good, if Miami's not very good, you're beating a bunch of mediocre teams, you need that one feather in your cap. Um, so I think Florida State needs it a little bit more um, in the opener. Right. It's tough. I mean, I've had to think about it for a second. I can see your point on that one. I just, like I said, I think that people will, are soon to forget. I think that we'll, we'll get down the season, we'll go, eh. The loss, okay. Like, look at Oregon last year. A good, lot of people people go, uh, what we thought about Bo Nix, and, and people forget what, what was it, 56-3 to three or whatever, 49-3, to three, whatever the first it, game it was. It was 49-3. Th- it was a lot to three. To three. So, yeah, they didn't score a touchdown that game in the Chick-fil-A kickoff. But then comes end of the season, people are talking about Bo Nix for Heisman. Oregon, you know, should be – Possibly a playoff team. Come on. But I think part of that is the Pac-12 was also better. They had a chance to play against That's ranked true. teams like a Washington. They had a chance to you, – you had the opportunity to get those ranked wins later in the year. Where, but uh, you made your point earlier. Like, nobody cares about September. Like, if, you have, if your schedule sets up where you can get wins later, you can mask that one loss for the right. most part um, later down the stretch. Yeah, and, and like you said, it leads perfectly into our number six team. And our number six team out of the Pac-12 is the USC Trojans. Coming in this year, wow, talk about taking, you know, Lincoln Riley year one, taking the college football world by storm, and then laying two, and I mean two, giant eggs to end the season, losing and getting the the bejesus kicked out of you in the Pac-12 title game. And then I know people were banged up. I know not everyone played, but you USC, you can't lose to Tulane. You can't like that can't happen. And all the good stuff that they did all year long, you know, people would excuse the Utah loss in mid October last year, you know, 43, 42 at Utah people go, Oh, okay. And then they lose the opener there, man. Caleb Williams back. Caleb Williams is a beast. I don't want to hear any of this nonsense, you know, going into last year, we heard all of this, like Caleb Williams hate, that he couldn't read a defense, he wasn't a very good quarterback, and we're like, okay, yeah, we get it. Oklahoma fans, you can be sour as you want. Like, I get it. You want to, if a guy leaves your team, it's the same thing as in the NFL when a guy leaves your team, you always like kind of kick him on the way out and be like, I really wasn't that good because he no longer plays for us. Caleb Williams is a damn good quarterback, man. He he won the Heisman last year. He this dude legitimately has a shot to win another Heisman. You know, you take a look at 42 touchdowns to five interception, 4,500 yards, adds in another 10 touchdowns on the ground, 382 yards on the ground. You know, granted, yes, he lost Jordan Addison. He does get Taj Washington back this year. I do like him quite a bit. Um, Mario Williams as well. He's interesting. A little undersized for me. That 5'9 size always, like, kind of, like, is a little bit hesitant. But really fresh. You know, our, our conversation for USC should really be about the defense. Like, I would start with Kalen Bullock. Like, at the end of the day, that's where my notes started with. Kalen Bullock, 6'3 safety, have five interceptions on the year. USC's defense was good only because they got a boatload of turnovers. They couldn't stop anybody, but if they, they did force a boatload of turnovers you take a look at it they wound up having a grand total of i want to say 19 they had 19 interceptions 
They recovered nine fumbles. They had 28 turnovers last year. Like, that's that's really, really good. For, and then on top of it, throwing 40 sacks. Yeah, that's a good team defense, but they didn't stop anybody. I don't know. Tell me where you're seeing uh, USC. I mean, they have, another, they have a third great receiver there in Dorian Singer, so they have, lead, they have weapons. They're not going to have offensive players. Lincoln Riley's going to have loads of receivers. He's going to have loads of running backs. His, you know, Caleb Williams is fantastic, all that. But I will never take, truly take a Lincoln Riley team seriously ever again until they prove they can play defense. Now, look, I'm just going to put this out there. Yes, the national championship game between Georgia and TCU was a laugher and a complete absolute beatdown. But if USC and that terrible defense went to the playoff and had to play Ohio State, Michigan, or Georgia, or TCU, they would have been giving up 45 or 50 points in any of those football games. And it wouldn't have even been funny. Caleb can't do it all by himself. Baker Mayfield, when he was there at Oklahoma, the reason why they lost to Georgia is that defense couldn't get off the field in the second half of the Rose Bowl. Lincoln Riley's teams cannot play defense. And until they actually figure that out and get some guys who can actually tackle and stop people consistently, you're going to be a great, you're going to put up a bunch of numbers. You're going to be a, you're a paper champion. You're a hollow tiger. I'm not scared of you. You might have tons of Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks. That's fantastic. But none of them have any true hardware from a team perspective. And that's your biggest problem. And that's what you have to get figured out at USC. You have every little thing you ever want right now. Even though Oklahoma is a blue blood of blue bloods, you're at USC, you know, blue blood of blue bloods, and you're in Hollywood. You have, should have no trouble getting anybody. You went out and got Barry Alexander from Georgia. Maybe that's the big defensive tackle you need to really solidify that defensive line, start building that mentality of getting tough in the trenches and actually becoming a full-on football team and not a seven-on-seven seven, you know, flag football squad. You need to be physical at the line of scrimmage. And if you want to compete with even Utah, you've got to get tougher because you were, didn't even compete with them in that football game. Yeah, Caleb was banged up, but you were going to dominate at line of scrimmage on every play. And that's – Dan Lanning went to Oregon for a reason. He's getting talent up there. They're going to build players. They're going to play defense and get after you. Utah's going to do it with Kyle Winningham every single year. They're going to be tough, and they're going to be grinding it out. They're going to get you. And if you want to go to the Big Ten and you want to play tough, good luck because Michigan and, Jar- and Harbaugh, they got it going. Wisconsin's building a program. Ohio State's always got the dudes. And there's always guys in Iowa and Minnesota and Penn State and wherever. They're going to be tough and eat you alive. You've got to get tougher if you want to compete at a high level. And this is more of a – you. sometimes you might, get, might have to get rid of Alex Grinch. Get rid of him, clean house. But you've got to change your philosophy of being a better football team, being tough. And that starts in that line of scrimmage, offensively and defensively, and getting guys who want to tackle. Corey Freeman was the number one overall recruit two years ago. And the dude has what, maybe maybe 12 tackles? In his entire career, let me look this up. In two years, Corey Freeman was the number one overall can't miss recruit, get from California, 24 tackles and two and a half sacks. In two years, you're the number one overall recruit and you are doing nothing. That is underdeveloped. That is on the coaching staff for not getting a player to play. And he's not the only one. That's everyone on that roster. And until they start playing defense and being tough, they're not going to be like the Matt Liner, Reggie Bush squad. And, you know, those dudes, they will light you up. Those guys all went to the NFL. Under Pete Carroll, that was legit men playing against boys. Right now, you don't have those defensive players who can step up and get you big stops on a national level. You can might be able to beat up on the Stanfords and the Cows and the Arizonas, the Arizona States, but until you actually get yourself figured out, Lincoln Riley, on defense as a whole, your teams will never compete nationally, and you'll just be a name and a brand that'll be washing away, and in four years, you'll be fired because you haven't done anything. That's where you need to get your focus and squared away at, getting stops, being tough, being physical. The fancy pants offense will only get you so far. When the meat comes and the rubber hits the road, you've got to get grinded out and get stops on defense. You were giving up 400 yards total a game last year, and that was seventh in the Pac-12. It was terrible. You've got to improve this year or you're going to be run out of town. Your schedule really begins October 14th, in my opinion, when you head to Notre Dame. Marcus Freeman's got that team playing a little better. They're tough. Can you go into South Bend and get a dub versus Notre Dame, big rival? If you can't, there's bigger – the, the red alarm should be going off right now that you don't have it all figured out at USC in your one-year wonder. Your final six games, though, this is where it's all had. You can be 6-0 and ahead in Notre Dame. You got Utah at Cal, Washington at Oregon, UCLA. You need your team ready to go for the back half. We don't care what you do in September. You better be 6-0. and If you're not, there's bigger issues. You've got to be able to be physical and grind it out and get stuff done when it matters. Because if you make the playoff, you're going to run into a Michigan or Ohio State or a Georgia or an Alabama or an LSU. You're going to run into a team that is built 
to withstand the punishment and be the punisher. And if you can't handle it, you're going to get embarrassed on a national level and you're going to get run out of town. This is a big year for you because you showed up last year, put up tons of points, got a Heisman Trophy winner. All is great. Now you actually need to start winning games at a national level that actually matter, not just in the Pac-12. The league is very tough. You've got to show up every single week. You've got to be smart and play balanced football. If not, you're destroyed. Can you do it with the talent? I think it's possible. Will you? That's the true question. Yes, this team could go 12-0. You could run through the entire schedule, make the playoff, and everything's great. And your floor could be 9-3. and three. So ceiling undefeated regular season, floor 9-3. and three, But it really comes down to, can USC get a defense? And can you actually prove that you're truly a tough football team? They bring back, they got in the transfer support of Marshawn Lloyd. I'm with you on Foreman. Foreman needs to be better. Defense as a whole, just everyone needs to be better on defense there. Uh, if they can continue, they can hide a lot of issues if they can continue to force turnovers. If they can be opportunistic and do that, you're going to, you're going to hide it and you'll be viewed as one of the top teams in college football all year long. The scary part is exactly like you said, Fresh is when you get into the playoff or you get into those New Year's Day six games and then you wind up getting boat raced in those games because your your defense is not at that level. Like, are you going to be good enough to get to that level? Take a look at a guy like Shane Lee coming back. Like, he, he good, good linebacker right there. Are these guys able to really put in what what's going to be required of them going into this season. You're right. The ceiling for them is 12-0. and 0. That end of the season, granted, they have that early on, this team's going to probably roll to 6-0 and 0 very, very easily, and it's going to set up a huge game against Notre Dame that second week of October in South Bend. Notre Dame's got some big games this year, especially with who they're matched up with, Ohio State, Clemson, and USC. There's some really interesting games that we're going to be tuned in for. But you follow that trip and host Utah, who has had your number back to back years. Like, are you going to be able to come down such a rivalry game to a team that's really just taking you to the woodshed every single year so far? And then you look at the, how they end the season. They end with Washington at Oregon and then UCLA in the Coliseum and not in the Rose Bowl. Again, home game for both of those teams, in my opinion. And then they're off Thanksgiving weekend. I know that they start early in that week zero thing, but it really sucks that they're off that weekend of Thanksgiving because depending on how a lot of those rivalry games go is going to really determine what we think of this USC team. I mean, you're right. 12-0 and is the ceiling. I mean, worst case scenario, if, if you're talking to me, what's the worst possible case scenario? Now, I don't foresee this happening, but 8-4. and 8-4 and four is their worst case scenario to me. 12-0, and 0, I think that this is a, a anything and everything is on the table in between. We're going to see because if defense is not better, we know it's fascinating. I'm interested to see. I hope Sam Hartman's got a connection with his wide receivers for that week. Um, the October 14th game against the Irish because that could really get interesting. And we know what Bo Nix and Washington carries. I don't know, Fresh. I really don't. I think that this is a, a tough road to go for USC, but the expectations are high. So, yeah, that's where I see with USC, man. Um, I don't know. I really don't with USC. Well, and you look, right now we're talking about the expectations for USC, the reason why Lincoln Rod was hired out there, is not really to win the Pac-12 or even right. really to win the Big 12. It is to win a national championship. And as we've seen, you don't have to win your conference to get in in the four. And obviously now we're expanding out to 12 in a couple of years. But you have to be tougher to win those games against the elite national competition. Um, and that's where Lincoln Riley, every year, they look great, but they don't play defense. And if he can actually figure that out, and sometimes you've got to maybe fire guys who are your friends to get someone to light a fire in there and make, make a play um, and get the defense better. But that's the only, only way that USC is actually going to be successful under Lincoln Riley is if they actually play legitimate defense at some point. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, those are our teams from number 10 all the way to number six. And now the only ones we have left are our top five teams in all of college football going into the preseason. These are the favorites to win it all, to make the playoff. I think there's a good chance that one of our champions comes from this these five here because it's going to get real interesting. But every one of those five have a big question mark going into the season. So we'll release that, but make sure you like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. The special thank you for our producer, Drew. Without him, none of this is possible. So make sure you're going to spinablesports.com. Yep, that is spinablesports.com. Subscribe where you ever get your podcast from, where Apple, Spotify, Good Pods, Amazon Pods, Stitcher. I don't know them all, folks. You know what I mean. But wherever you get your podcast from, like, subscribe. Make sure you lock yourself in because we got a little bit more coming out for you. If you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe to that. We're on our way to 200 subscribers there. 25,000 Twitter followers, everything and anything. This is grown. This is going to be our biggest season yet. We got a couple of other announcements coming your way at some point or another. And we'll be here all season long. We're about, we're getting closer and closer to that week zero kickoff. Not too many Saturdays left without college football. We're almost there. 20 down in our top 25, five to go. Can't wait, Haps. Until next time. Bye, y'all.